just want to welcome everybody, friends and uh, the candidates and, and uh, voters and others here. Thank you for coming to this forum organized by uh, the Owings County Record, Calvary Record. That's me, I'm Robin Smith. I work for them. And also uh, the Chronicle, uh, also hosting. And uh, tonight we have the, I'm going to get the names in the wrong order, but it's the political forum with the candidates running for the Essex, Caledonia, Orleans County District. There's one representative for the House in Vermont in that district. And um, tonight we have our candidate, Paul Fay, Republican incumbent from Newark, and Martha Allen from Canaan, the Democratic candidate. Our moderator for this evening is Scott Wheeler, a uh, publisher of Vermont's Northland Journal and uh, an experienced moderator. By this time, he's done quite a few of these. And he's also a former member of the legislature, the House. So, you know, he's comfortable asking questions. Uh, we'll do a little bit of the format. Um, and also, of course, we're being taped for broadcast and also go online so if your friends say, that I wish I was here, they can see it on any KTV uh, on Comcast or online and they post a way to get there too on YouTube and on the website. So it's a good way to find out what's going on. Um, let's see, what else did I say? The order of... That's up to you. Okay. Um, did I leave anything else? No. I think so, right? Um, we're going to have questions from the newspapers, which Scott has, and he will pose some of them. We're going to pause about halfway and open it up to questions from the floor. And then uh, we'll be able to answer our questions, and then there'll be closing arguments. We give folks about a half, an hour to do this. We can give the audience. I think we should be that should be fine. And uh, take it away. Okay. My first question to the moderator is to Robin. Robin, name off every town in this district. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few in Essex County, Newark, and Caledonia County, and Westmore, and. And the, the list is there, but it includes Keenan, Norton, um, Pond, and some of the Gores and other towns in the area. Anybody well, here that I left out? I left out. I left out. I left out. I left out. I Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm glad you're able to squeeze in and find my seats. Um, when, I, when I picked up my wife at work, uh, she thought we were going on a date night. Um, so I said, hey, let's, um, so we, we stopped in Derby Village, picked up a bit to eat, and this is our date night tonight. So let's make it, let's make it good. Um, so we're going to start off by uh, giving each one of you two minutes to to introduce yourself and why you are running. And then after that, there's going to be a series of questions. <coughs> and the first one, will you'll answer the first one first, then second, and then the second question, Paul, you will be answering. So we'll go back and forth, who answers it, who answers it first. Uh, so the first question comes is, who are you and why are you running? I'm Martha and uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, I've been in Vermont since 1977. I've taught in, in Vermont's public schools for 30 years, um, over in the Lake Champlain Islands, and then uh, in Canaan. I met my husband, and he was teaching in Canaan, so I moved there. And we uh, bought property in Canaan, built ourselves uh, home there, raised two boys, and I just love our small town. And one of the reasons why I'm running is that I really want to have our, see our small towns thrive. And I think that we are challenged right now for multiple reasons. But I think that what we need 
need to do here is find a way to get younger uh, people to move to our smaller towns. And one of the things we really need to do without any question is uh, the internet. I, I live way up in the middle of nowhere and have uh, something on a tree. <laughs> Hope the tree doesn't work down. And so I've got some internet, but it's very difficult. It's, yeah, I don't have cell coverage up there. And, and that kind of thing, we aren't going to bring young families to our small towns if we don't uh, improve our infrastructure. And I know there have been fits and starts of doing that, but that's really important. Uh, a little background, um, my family uh, has Vermont roots. My great-grandfather was in the Vermont legislature. Uh, years ago with George Aiken, which was kind of fun because he's the one who coined the phrase uh, Northeast Kingdom. So even though my great my great grandfather lived down in Sherburn, um, back when it was called Sherburn, it's killing him now, um, there was that connection. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts, though so educated there with two, my two siblings, my dad and my father-in-law were uh, World War II vets, so I learned about all of that growing up, and um, I just really wanted to come back to Vermont as soon as I could. So once I got my teaching degree, uh, I moved to Vermont. Uh, so the internet is one thing. I'm really concerned about our small schools. Uh, I served as the Vermont NEA president for uh, nine years, and so I'm, I worked with other teachers and support staff personnel all around the state in work, uh, working to improve our public schools, and they are already extremely good um, for considering our rural nature. So um, I really want to work on keeping the small towns intact by keeping the small schools open and uh, help young families to move to our small towns. Okay, Paul, what makes you tick? Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, you know, I, small towns in my eyes are what Vermont is all about. Uh, I grew up in one, I grew in another. I'm one of the fortunate people who have two hometowns. But hometowns in Vermont are, are struggling to keep their identity. More and more are losing their ability to govern themselves. Each year sees more power flowing towards the center, which, as you know, means Montpelier. Uh, and I, I think, in terms of uh, what small towns are trying to do, is they're trying to, you know, uh, uh, have more power, keep more power at home, so that where the decisions are made are, are closer to the people they affect. Unfortunately, I think. Uh, there's more power flowing to uh, the center, and uh, Vermont is increasingly becoming a, 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 a top-down government. Taking an event in my own backyard, I understand what we're losing. Uh, I woke up one morning to learn that a large industrial wind farm is being planned for the rejoins of Seneca Mountain, which is only a short walk from my house. Um, I, uh, I, I, uh, I first ran for the house in 2014 and the farm was quite a big man. And over the years, I got a few weeks in and worked for changes that now allow local and regional planners to have more say. But what hasn't changed is the power to make the decision as to where these industrial turbines are going to be sited. And that still, is, that still resides in the hands of the Public Service Board, which is also known as the Public Utility Commission today. Uh, the, uh, I, I mean, I think I wanted to tell you that there's a renewed effort that's underway to change the site, uh, site dynamics. Last year, an Act 50 Commission was appointed by the legislature to hold public forums around the state to see how Act 50 is working out. Is it really helping how we, how we develop and uh, uh, protecting our environment? And as one of those six legislators, I've been working to put the issue of citing the wind turbines back on the table. <coughs> I want the power to cite the uh, wind project to be transferred to the Act 250 dis district commissions. There are nine such commissions distributed throughout the state. They have three members on each one, and members are appointed by the government. And they live, they all live in the region in which they review projects. I mean, the, uh, uh, in the Northeast Kingdom, that means the three commissions that serve on uh, District uh, uh, 7, I believe, maybe 9, I can't remember the numbers, but uh, are from the area. And so 
So they know, they know what the impact of the next two years, okay? Um, the, the, uh, we wanted to also let you know that uh, the uh, site of the industrial wind uh, farms and the push to consolidate our schools and school boards, they kind of run hand in hand in terms of where the power is coming to do that. And why is it called uh, consolidation or mergers appear to be making more sense for schools and more compact and urban areas? There are physical and cultural issues in rural communities that are being, either being overlooked or, or, or ignored. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think the push to put three kindergarten and kindergarten kids along with elementary school kids on a bus for a 15 mile or so round trip every day makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense either uh, what the impact is going to be in small towns. I think it's a lose and lose situation because it will not make education or moving to more more towns anymore. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see you. So. I know, I tried twice. So am I open to the park? I, I guess I couldn't see it. Okay, I'll try. I'll watch it. I'll see you next time. I'm sorry. 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 I'm
6 in the morning on Saturday. I was so impressed, and I live way up a dirt road. So impressed and grateful to those. They were all gentlemen, actually. The ambulance driver was female. But anyway, it was, um, I just felt so grateful to have you give, live in a rural place and have access to that kind of protection. So when I've been reading a bit about the ambulance situation here, uh, it's, been, it's been kind of heartbreaking. And I think one of the problems is uh, that we don't have people who are willing to go through the training. And I, one of the things I think we should try to do is get um, some classes in the high schools in the tech center, perhaps, at Newport, and, and get, get some kids interested in this, and, and maybe they, those who stay in the community, would follow, um, follow that path. Maybe they'd do something else, but as, as we all know, our volunteer fire departments and, and uh, EMTs and all have other jobs. It certainly isn't a paid position, but if there's a way to spend more time um, and energy in training more of our young uh, Vermonters who might find a new vocation. I think that that's uh, a way to uh, supplement supplement the, the staffing of this. And I, and I know it's going to be it's expensive to do, but um, I think that's one way we can, we can try to improve the situation.
one size fits all mentality. Uh, and, I, and, and I think if you put it in, in the context of small towns, we need, to, we need to have flexibility. We need to have an understanding of what will work here and what won't. And we have to have custom tailor-made kind of solutions to problems that a lot of times have their own obstacles to overcome. And I, and I think Act 46, I know when it came on before, I had a, I had a list of what the small towns were paying uh, per, uh, how much they were spending per pupil. And we were all under the larger schools, and yet we were being, in terms of how the uh, funding mechanism works, we were, we were paying to have those schools meet their budget. It was just, it was just outrageous. And to think that, you know, that the, the, the small towns were being penalized for actually uh, holding to a tight budget. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, I think Act 46 was uh, well intended, let's say, but I, I think it just needs a lot more work. I think it needs some fine tuning, and I'm glad we have a call like John Castle as a question. Okay, you want to ask one more, please ask one more question, Bob, and then we'll do the last question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question for Bob. Um, I Some people are concerned about the dramatic decrease of the herd population in the Northeast Kingdom. What, if anything, can the state do about it? Speaking of the deer? Uh, oh, the moose, the moose herd. The moose herd. Well, I mean, it's not only in the Northeast Kingdom or in Vermont, it's also in Maine and New Hampshire. And one of the things the, that's had a very uh, glorious impact on their herd is the tick. Not on its way up here with climate change, and we are now facing that kind of a that kind of a situation where it's it's a very hard to fight. And uh, they talk about if you have a, the denser the herd, the more likelihood you're going to spread the ticks. And it's so uh, the the fish and wildlife is going to kind of tumble around trying to find what will work the best. And I think uh, there are a lot of folks up here. They thought they were, you know, going about 80, 13 permits as far as the uh, as far as the rainbow season goes for uh, in a while. I think there were six other permits, some for a uh, wish of a lifetime uh, permit, and there's two or three of those, and there are two, at least a permit for uh, 13 total. 13 total. Aha, uh -huh. I thought they were outside that total. Well, I mean, it's even so, it's even fewer. Uh, and uh, the, uh, as, as the problem, if you take one or five, and there's a real fear that this is a thick problem going to increase. Uh, hopefully, science uh, will be able to find some way to kind of help us combat this, uh, this disease in terms of killing a lot of those ticks and being able to get to them quicker uh, and being able to pinpoint uh, where, this, where, the, where, the, uh, where these ticks are breeding or where they're really coming together. Uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, stop and, and, and either curb the curb the spread or, 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 or push it or push it further further uh, I don't want to say push it further out of the state because I don't want anyone else to do it. But I think I don't think there's a real ready uh, answer or solution to that problem now. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've seen maybe four. This year, I mean, driving home, my what I used to say to my children when they learned to drive, I'd always say, "Watch out for moose when you drive." And I'd say, and, and because you don't want to hit a moose, that's for sure. You'd say, "Swerve for a deer, swerve away from a moose." And you um, um, on that. Uh, but the whole idea of only 13 permits, I think that's one way to, to curb to curb that. Uh, and to try to keep the most that we have. And, but I think um, Paul's right about trying to uh, find some way to deal with the ticks, but as we all know, it's that you need some cold, below freezing weather for a length of time, or is it below zero? I'm not sure how cold it has to be to, get, to kill the ticks, and, and that's pretty scary. So um, I'm, I'm gonna have to read up on that to learn more Right the ticks, but it doesn't seem like anybody has the answer yet. Okay.
Okay, we're going to uh, now open it up to the floor for a bit. Uh, if anybody has any respectful questions to ask, uh, either or both of the candidates, and if it's correct, have one, uh, please uh, state who you would like it to answer. My name is Kevin I have a suggestion on the move situation. My dad told me years ago when we were inundated with rooms on roads, why don't the state of Vermont put salt lakes or something to attract the removes off the highways, out of the highways, maybe we wouldn't be killing so many of them. There we go. I, and I may have some other questions, but I'll let that uh, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> I interviewed your father on his 97th birthday. <laughs> 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 yeah. Nice to see you. Anybody? Yes. I agree with you about education. I, okay. There has to be something done. But um, what I feel is happening, or what I can read about may happen, is the penalizing of small towns with the funding. They get taken away from the small towns because they're not compliant with what the State Department of Education wants. And that irritates me to no end. I mean, why do you use money? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. of course it works, I will admit. It's all about money. Well, when the Act 36 came on the floor, most uh, of all about the small towns were taken away. I didn't understand how I was going to save money. I said, you know, that's all the nation. Aren't these superintendents trying not to get together and say, well, let's buy and buy, you know, we can save you some money. Can we go back and forth and work collaboratively with one another? You know, with this education funds? And just couldn't do it. We couldn't. You know, right then, that's really. You got any thoughts? Well, what worries me now, I think that uh, in the governor's office, um, in my encounters with some of his staff. Um, I was told we want to close brick and mortar schools and to save money. And that's what this person told me uh, last year. And it was very, not all of them of course, but that was basically find another way to educate kids, send them, close that school and put them all into another school was the plan, which is what Act 46 is doing to a certain extent. So, um, and that is what's um, frightening for small communities. I think the only way to keep our small town vibrant is to keep our small schools vibrant. And I understand that high school kids, I don't think high school kids mind riding on a bus farther in order to have a better science lab, it's be with more kids, be on a bigger team, but it's the elementary schools and the small children that I think really belong in their town and I think we, should, we could work on, rather than uh, having, if you have a declining population, and Brighton doesn't go, and I'm not sure about Charleston, but um, there are some small towns that do have declining population, and I think we should talk about co-location of services and try to bring uh, fam uh, school-based family mental health services into a school for starters, maybe do some of the senior uh, programs in a school, the schools that have some capacity, um, bring in daycare, um, have little kids come to daycare. You know that daycare is really expensive for so many families, and if you have a child in, in elementary school, you could bring your smaller child to the same place and have schools open um, full day, full year. And, and I think that's one of the solutions to try to make ends meet and on multiple levels for, for families and for small towns. If I could add it in, we want small towns to prosper, but what families are going to move to a town that has no schools? Right. Uh, it's just, it takes the, a lot of the identity away from the town, and uh, people don't want their kids on a bus for 50 miles out back. They just, and they imagine the kids five, six years old riding on a bus. Out. What's frustrating is, you probably um, <laughs> is, is when you hear realtors say, move to such and such a town, they have a great school. It's one of the first things that comes out of, out of a realtor's uh, mouth. Well, 
If we want people to move out of Clinton <coughs> County, live somewhere other than that, to um, the Northeast Kingdom, we all know those of us who have raised children here, it is an amazing place to raise children. And um, we need to have, we need to fight to keep our schools open. And I think that's why bringing other services into the physical building um, might be a, an answer. Okay. some of your, your views on, on topics, but if you had to pick one topic that you felt was the most important issue facing rural Vermont right now, what would that be, and how would you propose in the House, in the form of a bill, to fix this? Today is the uh, is the one become unaffordable to live, and the reason why is because uh, of the taxes, quite frankly, and the taxes are the sole mechanism for education. So something has to change along those lines. Something has to change in the way we fund education, and something has to change in the way we look at education. It's not the same who I went to or you did. It. I mean, then it's become an average social service now in terms of what it has to do inside those rooms. And quite frankly, uh, you know, uh, the cost of education is going up because their 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 children in school have uh, mental health issues. Or they come from fragmented families, so what the family needs to provide for the kids, it's now a school. I hear that some of the best the best meal they get in a day is for school. So now we're really looking at that, and I think so. I think we have to rethink how. Education is being offered and what we expect from that. And I and I and I think it's going to take appropriations from other sources, uh, especially in terms of seeing it as a real close sister to the social agencies in terms of what it's doing now. Uh, the kids have mentors, they, if there's a problem, things shut down. And uh, and and also now we're looking at the schools as a safety issue in terms of you know, what's happening in this random killing of students throughout the country, almost half in the world. So my feeling is that uh, we're wide open now to make some very fundamental changes as the way schools are being run and operated. And, uh, you know, we have to step outside the status quo and, and, and take a more, I don't know, more us to the appeal, a uh, step to really changing how we look at education and what we expect. In, in, in that answer, yes. you must have some idea as to what you would personally do to try to push that through. Well, basically, I, you know, I do not serve an education committee. And if you know anything the way the House works, the House works pretty much by committee. Mm -hmm. And so they hear the testimony coming in. What I do know is that I would make the income tax. I would use the income tax as one of the parties to uh, 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 fund education. And I would look for other ways in terms of whether, whether how, the, how appropriations are made for various agencies that basically provide services and now have education be rolled into that more than it is now, given more prominence. I don't know if it's being done now, but I don't believe it's being done enough that it is. And so that's, that's, that's the beginning step. But I really do think that this is not a, you know, this is not a one bill solution. This is going to be, I think we're going to have to try a variety of approaches. But the important thing is, is to go forward and not stick in the mud and, and, and just kind of pass over, uh, over the house as to, uh, you know, how, how we're going. Are we going to add uh, income tax or are we going to stay the property? Go back and forth against that issue. I mean, that's what caused the legislature to run so long this year. It was, it was, it was for five cents of the non residential tax rate. And, you know, and it ended up in one little bit. Okay, so, what about your? <laughs> If 
fight to eliminate the property tax. I think it's really important that we try to make taxation more fair and make it affordable for everybody. And I don't think that people uh, who aren't making much for income, I don't think they should be expected to pay, and they might live on a large uh, piece of property around in the Northeast Kingdom in particular. I think there are quite a few people who have, have a lot of property, but they don't have a high income. And I think that, that if we move to an income-based tax system, uh, that would bring some equity. And folks, I think, I'm not sure can be corrected, uh, but I think it's about 3% that people are paying now, but not if you're the wealthier folks aren't paying that same amount. And I think we need to make some kind of a balance. And that would give some relief in that regard. Uh, the schools, I think, are critical right now. We need to look at, instead of hammering about or losing pocket student population and all of that, we need to look at our students in our classrooms right now. And we need, we have children suffering from multiple um, traumas and ACEs, what it's referred to, with adverse childhood experiences. And that, those can be uh, reversed. You can do some great work with students, with children, if you, if you can get to them when they're very young. And another reason to have um, um, daycare in our schools uh, for the kids who need extra support uh, and be identified early on. I know that whenever our triple E um, early sexual education folks are go to people's homes and work with kids who are struggling, by the time they get into preschool, they tend to do better because they um, they've already been um, worked, uh, they've already been diagnosed and are on path. So I think that our schools are key in this state, and I think we could get people to move to move here because of our schools if we have the internet. We aren't going to get enough families to come. We all know that that's critical. So those are two two issues that I'm interested in. Okay, Corey. Uh, actually, uh, Jim directly. I've got two questions. One went directly from Mark, and I'm trying to figure out where you stand on two things. Um, as far as the property taxes go, that we were just speaking of, mm -hmm. you said decrease some depending on income level. Mm -hmm. Now, where would you, who would you suggest to pay the difference that would be up there in the schools, the town highway departments? Who would make up that difference? The, the, it would actually be an aggregate across the state uh, so that there are people who are, um, have much higher incomes and they're paying a lesser percentage of their income for schools where uh, people with lower incomes are paying a higher. And, and so if you, you can balance it out. The Public Assets Institute has been working on this for a couple of years to make sure that um, people will be able to pay their fair share and there's still enough money in uh, the coffers in order to fund, fund the education. So I'm looking to them because they've been doing the research on this for quite a while. And, um, and people have said, but what about volatility? Or if you have a job one year, so you're paying your taxes, whatever, and then you lose your job and next year, you aren't paying the, how does that work? Well, number one, if you're not working, you shouldn't be expected to pay the same amount of taxes. So that person uh, should be given some kind of um, relief. And, but if you look at the whole state as an aggregate, that all kind of smooths out. Did you have a second question? I did have a second question. Paul? Well, what would your money be if something like that did happen, Paul? How would you suggest who would pick up a cab, even though, you know, she says that there might be a plan there? Who's going to pick up that difference? Well, I think it's because obviously our down highway departments that keep going. Or yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't believe the difference uh, is going to be paid locally. I think we have to do it in terms of what's being appropriate at the state level. I think Mark is right. It has to be from multiple number of sources. Uh, you know, it's, it's really a, a very, very mind ending problem. And year to year, they keep kicking it around and still don't come up with a solution. I, ever since I've, I've been going in since 2014, this has always been front and center as an issue. And every year we kind of walk away and say, no, oh, maybe next year, kind of like the Red Sox. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, we never get, 
we just never seem to be able to get our head with the camera. I just think we have to take a very, we have to really look at a very overall uh, transformation and intention. What we want to do is how we're willing to fund it. Uh, and, you know, and, and certainly, uh, I mean, it's probably taxes, you know.
um, regulated. And there is a uh, weapon that, that could be used for um, opiate um, issues to help people who are uh, struggling with um, opiate But anybody, folks who are struggling with that, will could get more mental health services, and that would be a really good way to make um, to take some of that revenue to use for mental health counseling for people who are struggling. Okay, Paul. Um, I think the best way to regulate the public use of marijuana is, is through legalization. Certainly, we're getting anywhere with this war on drugs that's been going on and on and on. And, you know, it, we really it impacted the risk of a lot of people's lives. And, you know, the, the middle class is seeing these kids go to, go to prison when they pick up uh, nasty habits. Uh, and as Martha points out, I, I think, you know, um, you don't want to. I like to take it out of the hands of the outlaws, the bad guys, or this old black market, uh, because often, if someone's looking to buy some marijuana and the guy doesn't have any marijuana, he'll buy it and sell you something else. And uh, I think regulation, I think legalization will, give, will, will eliminate that. And the other thing I think uh, uh, legalization will do, it will, it will enter the next number of years, provide a body of evidence as to what the impact or health impact marijuana is having on people. And I think we don't know anything about that now. Uh, and I also the uh, the, uh, the the level of THC is all over the place. Uh, you don't know what's being you know what's, what's, what's being put in the whole lot of marijuana is being sold. I mean, Vermont has a very uh, good reputation of being a homegrown producing high quality homegrown marijuana, but uh, that's not the only marijuana that people get when they go uh, in up up uh, back roads or looking for. Um, uh, a solo in, in the city to buy to buy fuel. So I, I really think the legalization will help us kind of clean this up, and uh, maybe it's, even then it's it, it's going to be on the same level as booze. You're never going to be able to stop people from becoming uh, uh, dependent upon it and use it in a you know way that's unhealthy. So when you when you uh, encourage the taxation of it, the sale of oh, taxation. absolutely. Absolutely. I think we might as well make some revenue on it. It's going to be out there. And I think by doing that, we, you know, we get a, <laughs> you not only get the, the revenue, but we also get a little bit more control. Okay, the question again. I didn't introduce myself before. I'm Corey Curtis from Westmore. And I was actually wondering, in the past year or so, we've had some gun control bills passed. Okay. There's been talk of more next year. What are your stances on the Second Amendment, Article 16, passing any more, or the ones that were done? How do you feel about it? I would not support any of the gun bill until I got an opportunity to see how the present uh, law is working. And, and, I, and I do believe that the present law was a very measured response to uh, uh, protect the public safety, both in, uh, in school and out. Uh, I, 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 I know there's an issue in terms of whether uh, uh, a three round clip uh, is uh, affected by a second amendment. Um, that was one of the hardest things for me to kind of work out. And, I, and, I, and, and in the end, I've come close to believing it, 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 was, worth, it was worth being uh, installed in that bill, being, being part of that bill. It was uh, uh, basically a universal background check for any uh, transfer of weapons. With the exception of uh, close family ties, father, son, or half father, and son, or something like that, and then there was the idea of getting rid of the home stock, and the, uh, which was a really a calculated way to get around the federal government's law against uh, uh, fully automatic weapons. And then there was the uh, component that said uh, anyone who is under 21 will have to take a firearms training course before he can buy a gun. I think that's sensible. And now we come, so now we come back to the 30 round clip, and. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was in Vietnam, and he was in the legislature, and he voted for the bill as well. And his explanation interested me because it never occurred to me. He said, you know, we knew we were going to be hit. We'd take all our 30-round clips and we'd put them right beside them and line them up. 
they grabbed him right away. And he said, you know, a good man, a good, good guy, a well-trained infantry man, could probably change a person anywhere in three or five seconds in those situations. OK, let's put one of these yahoos in the room, all these the schools, and shooting people from the, uh, the hotel rooms. He's not going to have that kind of experience. It's going to take him longer. And from what I know, the longer it takes for someone to load, reload is, is, is really uh, an opportunity for someone to escape. It, to stall. Anything they can do to stall that shooter increases the likelihood that fewer people are going to be shot. And so, okay, I, I, my, the, the only other thing I would say to that is uh, it's not in the hands of the Supreme Court. It will like them, not yet. It's in the hands of the courts. You know, it's ideal, probably, and likely it will go both to the state and the federal Supreme Courts. Uh, and I think we, we, I'm ready to sit back and watch to see, see what happens. Uh, I, I, and, I, and, I, and I fully intend to give the law an opportunity to work. Uh, I, I'm not going down there. Your thoughts, Martha? I don't know what the plans are for next year and the current request. So I know that that I know that people are afraid that one to give them an inch, they'll take a mile kind of a thing. What I am a proponent of is safe use of guns. Um, we have we're a hunting community. We have we have a lot of hunters here. It's where people drive for long distance to come and hunt in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, when I started teaching in Canaan, all the kids would come during hunting season, drive in the gun racks and their pickup trucks and had their, had their rifles there because the, the, it gets dark so fast they could leave straight from school to go out to um, hunt. And nobody thought, you know, nobody thought anything about it because our kids were raised with um, respect for guns, and they took hunter safety, and it was used for hunting. It wasn't used for killing human beings. So um, I think that those laws are talking about this new culture that we're in, unfortunately, where we have a lot of stress on a lot of people, and they um, with mental health issues and resort to um, horrific
And we can listen to people come in and testify. Um, we just sent out surveys, had people fill out surveys. And now we're in the process of going through the replies and uh, working as a group to uh, come to terms with what we think people are really upset about and what, how it could be made better. And I think it could be made better by the fact that we've got to make a way that you can take an active fifty permit off the land if indeed what was intended to be developed there would never happen. And one of the problems with these active fifty permits for a lot of folks is once they go on the land, they ride on the land, even the land, even the land changes from one ship. And so you want to put a trail in somewhere and, want, and the lot calls for an active fifty on the, to have that trail, uh, and then the trail changes and goes elsewhere, your land is going to have that active 50 permit. And uh, I don't think it should be. I don't think it belongs there. I also think, of course, as I mentioned earlier, I want to see active 50 really control uh, the, the use of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, a re a renewable energy in terms of their generation of electricity. I, I think we really need uh, a commission that is sensitive to uh, issues that the, the public service board and the, uh, is it now? the uh, utility power commission is not. I think that was created basically to keep uh, rates down and to help uh, generate electricity get the best deal possible. Now we're into another ball game and now we're using renewable energy sources to create electricity and in fact electricity is really going to be what replaces the fossil fuel it's just coming. We don't know how. We've got, we, we know that we're putting cars on the markets now with a very with a little a heavy discount for electric cars. Uh, and we also know there are plans to make uh, put in um, charging stations every, every 30 miles, from 30 miles from race of towns to grow up Vermont. But the real bug of is, of course, they're also at the same time going to push a carbon tax. They're going to push a carbon pricing. And they're going to do that uh, to force us. To, uh, to restrict uh, driving. And that's going to, the bonus, the, the bonus of that is going to fall on people who live in rural areas. So, so we have to kind of now try to find how that's going to happen and try to make it happen in urban areas. Let, it, let the taste test case be made in urban areas where there are more people, it's public transportation. And let's see how this works. Let's see how much carbon it takes out of the air. I don't want us to wind up the, uh, really uh, paying us being uh, rural towns and communities where we have to drive 40 miles to work. I, mean, I drive 16 miles to get a quart of milk back in the woods. I don't want to see us pay that kind of tax. And I'm very curious about the promises, how we're going to be re uh, uh, reimbursed. Uh, plant company, that's supposedly whatever we're paying taxes on, on gasoline, we have to make that $50. It would somehow get the trouble back to the folks. I actually see that happening. I think it could be back to the game. You know, it's just too problematic. So, I think I can do this. Okay, any more questions? All right, the question is what should the legislature change about Act 250? sits on the Act 250 Commission probably uh, answer that question more thoroughly than I'm able to. But I do um, think that we, we have a beautiful state and we want to keep our state beautiful. And, but um, not at the expense of uh, people's jobs and people's uh, ability to run their small business. So I think that we need to come up with a way to compromise. And I, I think uh, with Paul talking about looking at each component and the forums and listening to the people, uh, I think that, that something like that will come out of it. I think that there's got to be some flexibility. Um, renewable energy is something we need to look at. Industrial wind, I think we found, is not the answer here, especially up here. And um, my thought is if you want to use industrial wind and put one smack dab on in Charlotte and see how that goes and, and then come and talk to us a bit later. But uh, the, the um, carbon tax to me as it stands is really is regressive and you really shouldn't uh, the, we would be punished up here and uh, as everybody you just need a count. You don't have to drive 16 miles to get you milk. Know. <laughs> 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 
state as each one being land, or as uh, as Robin says, closed arguments. Um, you have two minutes, so anything you want to talk about, Martha, in two minutes is your your time. I'll get to that in a minute, I think.
We tried a number of funding uh, alternatives and it all failed. And they support me. Thought about maybe we should um, uh, use a uh, use a more tax. Maybe give them more money and use a more tax. Maybe uh, we could uh, make people who like to kayak and use the lakes. Maybe we can make them uh, rest the rest of their boats. Get a few bucks there. Maybe we could put a a, 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 a some sort of a refund on uh, on water on bottles of water. And make them do anything we can to try to squeeze a nickel, because that's what we're really up against. We can get some help from the feds, but you know, it's just going to be a long, a long haul. And you know, and so uh, I think the problems in state government uh, are, are large, and I, and I think what we really are in a transition in terms of we, for a long time, on a state who had rural values. And communities that kind of work together and kind of almost make it more identity under themselves. That that's that's changing. I don't know how to hold on to it. I like I wish I did. But that is what is going to be changing. And when it changes, we're going to lose rural values that kind of made Vermont what it is and the what we all love. I'm afraid. I think it seems to me that the more the, People pass regulations because they want to keep them on as it is. But I do get up here with other regulations. I don't want to sue the regulation without any respect to take. I, you know, and yet that's what we're looking at, uh, a more regulated society. And so we're going to have to be very careful and very smart if we're going to try to walk the balance between, you know, the freedom that Vermont gives us and the, and the ability to enjoy the land and at the same time, uh, Raise money and get, I get, I get a source of revenue that will pay for things we need to be done. So I think those are really, really uh, outstanding issues that we're going to face in the next, well, even more than the next few years. They're going to be around for a while. I just want to say, I don't want to say it, I don't want to say it. 30 seconds for you, everybody. This is when I'm breaking into my interpretive dance. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and by the way, I don't, I don't know if you're aware, but Todd Pronto is a uh, is a singer who goes down to Nashville and everything, so he could sing for you. And, and I believe your your partner's a dancer too, so you're used to you know, So there you go. <laughs> you brought the shoes. I didn't know I had the answer. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming, folks. Thank you for coming. I'm sure my wife had a beautiful date in the house.